Why don't we go ahead and get started? I'm going to talk to you today about pleural effusions and empyema, and these seem to be two simple concepts. However, they're probably the most mismanaged <coughs> that you'll find and that you'll be called upon to make some decisions because they're not properly assessed. The other point that I'm going to bring out is there's two things on here that will be on your written exams, okay? It's real simple, real easy to remember, but they're always there. <laughs> so what I want to do is I want to review the etiology and pathophysiology of pleural effusions because as a general surgeon, you're going to run across them. And even if you never do chest, you're going to see these regardless of trauma, regardless of just general abdominal, regardless of other um, medical issues. You're going to want to be able to differentiate the uh, exudative from transudative, and that's terrible. Um, does this work? That's better. Um, and that's, that's what's on the test. That, that's a nice written question, and so you need to know uh, what the difference is. And then to outline a systemic approach to diagnosis and management. This is very systematic. However, when you are called to put in a chest tube, those, these, this algorithm is never followed. And so that's where we run into traps. What are the causes? Well, just physiologically, you have increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, which can be a cause. Namely, you're making too much fluid. It's going to go into places where the spaces are open and where fluid can be accumulated. So where's the easiest place? Abdomen and lung, OK? If you have congestive heart failure or SVC syndrome, you're going to get increased lymphatic flow. And believe it or not, even though the pleura seems to be very hard, it's very porous. And so this fluid just leaks into the uh, pleural cavity. You can have reduced intravascular oncotic pressure, people who are poorly nourished, cirrhotics, uh, people with uh, cancer. Um, or you can have increased oncotic pressure in the pleural space. <clears throat> You can have permeability issues, um, infection for one, that's how empyemas are formed. You can have decreased in lymphatic drainage, mainly cancers are the things that will cause that. Um, if you have a cirrhotic, cirrhotics always develop a right pleural effusion. It's a given. And the reason being is that you have too much fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Well, the peritoneal cavity, by rights, is not separated from the pleural cavity. You know, you have lymphatics along the diaphragm, they absorb that fluid, it's overwhelmed, and it goes right up into the chest. Um, you can have um, increased flow of fluid from the lung into the pleural cavity, particularly with pulmonary edema. Um, if you have a, a traumatic issue or disruption of vessels or the thoracic duct, and then, of course, there's an iatrogenic cause of pleural effusion, which are misplaced central lines, and please don't forget that. You know, the first thing you want to do if you're called with somebody from another service that says, okay, we've got a big, uh, a big pleural effusion we need a chest to, make sure you look at them. You know, just don't look at the x-ray, look at them because uh, sometimes you will find a central line and the x-rays weren't checked and then you have a problem. Symptoms are real simple, dyspnea, chest pain, dizziness, or syncope. There's not much to it. Most of the time, these people are short of breath. They may be asymptomatic, and I'll go over the asymptomatic pleural effusion because that's a trap. Um, that there are certain points to that that you need to remember. <clears throat> How do you evaluate the exudate? All right, this is what you have to memorize. Okay. So whenever you have pleural fluid, by rights, it should be sent for analysis. Like I said in the last lecture, any time you tap anything, any time you get fluid out of somewhere, you have one chance at that fluid to give you a diagnosis. And so a sample should be sent to the laboratory, OK? And what you're looking at in pleural effusions for exudates is you want a protein to serum protein level of greater than 0.5 you want a ratio, misspelled, of LDH to serum of 0.6. If the LDH level is two-thirds of the upper limit of normal for the serum, or if your albumin is 1.2 grams per deciliter in the uh, pleural fluid. So basically, if anything is over 0.5, they give you a list of numbers and they say it's pleural fluid and it's over 0.5, 
they, it's going to be an exudate. They're not going to make it um, very uh, um, problematic for you. Now, the key to this, though, is what is the one thing that's seen in this slide over and over again? You're comparing plural fluid to serum protein levels, or you're comparing plural LDH to serum LDH, or you're comparing plural glucose to serum glucose. So whenever you tap something, what do you have to do? You need to send a concomitant blood sample. Don't rely on the blood sample from four weeks ago. It needs at least be done on the same day. Otherwise, the analysis is meaningless. You don't know what you have. For exudates, you also want to send off a cell count. If neutrophils predominate, you probably have an acute inflammatory process. If you have lymphocytes, it means they're chronic, and, and there's a whole host of chronic infectious diseases that can cause an exudative effusion. If there's eosinophils, it's usually related to either, parasites are a big thing. Medications can do it, allergies. Um, chronic hemothorax, a pulmonary infarct, et cetera. And if you see mesothelial cells, you need to try and remember that if they're over 5%, it excludes tuberculosis or pleurisy. Usually when you're seeing mesothelial cells, it means you have a malignancy. <clears throat> the total protein is greater than 7 grams per deciliter. You need to think about a hematologic process, mostly multiple myeloma, because remember that you're going to have excessive proteins made and it will show up in a pleural effusion. If your glucose is lower than your serum, okay, standard, it doesn't have to be below 60. If it's lower than your serum glucose, something in there is using that glucose. So more than likely it's infectious. Now for florid empyemas, it's going to be, glucose is going to be less than 60. But again, general rule of thumb, if it's lower, then you have an infection. If, it, if the LDH is greater than 1,000 or very high, more than likely it's an empyema, although you could have a malignancy. You want to send it off for amylase, just in case, particularly if you have a questionable patient and an abdominal problem and you're not sure what's going on. Always send it off for cytology. Can't hurt. It's not that expensive. And then gram stain culture, AFB, and fungal cultures. AFB, very important. History is important to determine if you have a risk patient, but remember, tuberculosis is on the rise. <clears throat> For empyemas, what happens is that you start out, somebody goes, goes to the doctor and they have a cold. And a chest x-ray is not obtained. They might be listened to. And they're given some form of antibiotic. Okay? They're treated for three or four days. They don't get better. And they go back to the doctor. And the antibiotic has changed. So by three weeks out, they then go back. And what they're saying is that I have chest pain when I t on deep inspiration. Now, how many times have you heard that history? Or how many times has that history been recorded? What happens is that you start out with a reactive effusion, which is sterile. But as the infection progresses, you get bacteria into the lung. You actually do get transudation of bacteria across the pulmonary bed. And then this fluid is a great culture media, and it becomes infected. So it will go from an uncomplicated free flowing white, high white count effusion to a complicated effusion where your pH is going to be low. That's a sign of infection. If it's less than 7.3, it's infected. Your glucose is going to be low. Your LDH is going to be high. And then you subsequently develop loculation. So if they give you a pleural fluid analysis which says the glucose is 80, the pH is 7.1, and the LDH is 900, okay, it's infected. That's not normal. And then what happens is that you'll get organisms in there and, the, and then you'll get pus. 
Okay, so if you have a pneumonia or a patient who comes in with a pneumonia or an infected patient with an abnormal chest x-ray and a fluid effusion, the diagnostic algorithm is you first need to do a thoracentesis because you don't know what you have. The first thing you do is not put in a chest tube unless they're an extremist and they're in trouble or they have a concomitant uh, tension pneumothorax. And this is how you manage it. If it's transudative, not exudative, meaning it's just fluid, it's not infected, you don't have, it's not thick, you want to treat the underlying cause first. So, patient comes in, clear-cut history of congestive heart failure, they have a pleural effusion, they call you, I want a chest x-ray because of the pleural effusion, what are you going to say? Tap it. You're not going to put in a chest tube. Tap it, give them some relief. If they have respiratory distress, that is not cardiac related, okay? Tap it, drain it, treat the failure. They don't need a chest tube. However, the exudative effusion depends on the, the cause. So, if it's symptomatic, start with a thoracentesis based on the results. So you do your thoracentesis, you send it off to the lab. You get the results back, which should come back within four hours, except for the cytology. Then you can decide on what you need to do. If you do the thoracentesis, don't just take 10 cc's out unless that's all you can get. You have a needle in the chest, that's a potentially dangerous situation. Take out as much as you can take out. That'll give them symptomatic relief. You have plenty to send off, and then you can decide on your definitive therapy. Uncomplicated paramnemonic effusions generally resolve with antibiotics alone. Okay, that's if they're caught early, the thoracentesis are done, is done, the um, organism, the culprit organism, is identified and the appropriate antibiotics are given. Remember that for an, uh, aminoglycosides do not function at a low pH. So if you have a paranemonic effusion and the pH is 7.1 and you give them genomycin or tobramycin, it's not going to do any good. Okay? Um, Complicated effusions or empyemas may require drainage. The question is, is how do you drain it? And I'm going to show you some x-rays that you really want to stay away from. And then malignant pleural effusions, what you want to do is ser serial thoracentesis. Malignant pleural, pleural effusions are really very easy to determine. What you'll do is you'll get a call and somebody's done a thoracentesis, relatively asymptomatic patient, and it's bloody. Bloody pleural effusion in the absence of trauma is a malignancy until proven otherwise. So you just do repeated. Oftentimes you need to do VATS for diagnosis because they can't find the cause. You'll get in there, you'll see studying or you'll see a mesothelioma or something. And you do a pleurodesis only if the lung is not trapped. So the call for VATS with pleurodesis in the face of a malignancy, you need to be very judicious about doing these uh, and about doing a pleurodesis because if the lung doesn't expand, the pleurodesis won't work. <clears throat> and this is the algorithm for the pleural effusion. And if you want these slides, I can email them to you. Just get a hold of me and I'll do it. What you do is um, if there's, you get a chest x-ray. Okay, if the plain chest x-ray doesn't show it, we always forget that you can do a lateral decubitus chest x-ray. You know, the techs don't want to do it, but that's a good modality without running the CT scan. Um, and if there's no effusion, or if it's small, or if it doesn't layer out, you can watch them. If there is a large effusion, you want to know if the patient has congestive heart failure or not. If they don't, have congestive heart failure, so there's, um, you know, there's a significant amount of fluid, you want to go ahead and do a thoracentesis. Notice in this whole thing, I don't have a CAT scan in here. You don't have to have one, particularly if you do a lateral decubitus. Unfortunately, what happens is by the time you all are called, the CAT scan's already done. Makes your life easier, but you need to know what you're looking at. Okay. If the, um, if the fluid's infected, or if it's a transudate, then 
you go ahead and send the fluid off for analysis and then determine which way you're going to uh, treat it. If it's a transudate, then you know back off and all you're doing is symptomatic treatment. If the patient has a known malignant pleural effusion and it's symptomatic, if it's not symptomatic, you just observe it, okay? If it is symptomatic, what you want to do is do serial thoracentesis and generally our cutoff is after the third time around, the patient basically gets sick of it and then they're referred for a VATS and determine diagnosis and then determine if anything can be done. Um, if it's a trapped lung, we really can't do anything. We determine that when we're in the room. What happens, you have the scope in, you have the anesthesiologist expand the lung. If the lung doesn't expand, you just back out. You know, leave the chest tube in. You pull the chest tube not when the fluid stops draining because it won't stop draining. It's just when they become asymptomatic and then they may need to be referred for a more advanced therapy such as a pleural catheter or something like that. Okay, if the lung does expand, however, you can insert, insert sterile talc, which still is our best modality. They don't have tetracycline available anymore, and um, put your tubes in and then just wait till the drainage stops. Please do not try to do a um, pleuridesis through a chest tube. It doesn't work. There's no way. It just doesn't get to where you need to go. Now, this is an important one because we don't think about it, and this will come up on your boards for the chylothorax. Remember, it's usually traumatic or iatrogenic, so you have to have a history. History of central lines, history of an old car wreck, history of an old operation, history of a left thoracotomy, history of a left subclavian artery to something bypass, which is usually the cause. Um, it, so there is an underlying cause for a chylothorax. The only time they're spontaneous is if you have a malignancy in the region. Okay? Um, and if it's spontaneous, then you need to suspect a neoplasm. The fluid is mil milky, but it can be mistaken for pus, particularly if you haven't seen a lot of them. Therefore, if you do a thoracentesis on someone and the fluid comes out milky, Again, important, don't assume, send it for analysis. You want to send it for cholesterol, triglycerides, and um, <clears throat> LDH, and, and cell count, okay? Because cell count's going to be high. But the key is cholesterol and triglyceride. Pleural fluid does not contain either one of these normally. <clears throat> Management. And this is an oral board question. And you're going to hear controversy, and you're going to hear all sorts of things if you take review courses. This is the standard of care, okay? I know what they do on the outside, and it's gross mismanagement, but conservative management is still the mainstay. The hospitals don't like it. The insurance companies don't like it because it takes too long. But the bottom line is it works, and this is how you do it. Strict NPO not clear liquids, not low-fat diet, not put a chest tube in and send them home and tell them not to eat fat. You keep them in the hospital, they take absolutely nothing by mouth. Because why? Let's speak up. Right, you want to decrease lymphatic flow. Lymphatic system's damaged. Decrease the flow. It's a low-pressure system. It should scar. Just takes time. You drain them with a chest tube. And this is one of, you just put the tube in, let them drain, get good drainage, and you put them on TPN. Probably the only time that TPN is sanctioned nowadays. And you wait. Three weeks, minimum. You could try octreotide as an adjunct. Effectiveness is questionable. It won't hurt anything. It may not speed it up. But the key to this is patience. Now, the only time you operate is when you're pushed. And, and I don't mean hospital administration pushing you to get the patient out of the hospital. Okay? 
I mean when it doesn't resolve. You give them three weeks, the chest tube drainage should come down to zero, should stop. You try them on clear liquids, and what I do is if they don't increase drainage after clear liquids for a couple of days, I'll increase their diet. If they do increase drainage after a couple of days, I'll back off, make them MPO for another week. And I generally give these patients a month. Now, it's only after a month that I will go in and actually operate. And then you'll never find it. They'll tell you use cream. They'll tell you put uh, uh, methylene blue. They'll tell you put an NG tube down. It, it, there's no way. You will not see the problem. When you go in to operate, you have to know where these are located. It's a blind operation, and all you do is you basically take large stitches at the junction of the subclavian artery and the, and the aorta on the left side, right in that corner, and hope that you got it, because there's no way you're going to see it. If there's a tumor there, you're going to have to back out. Um, most of the time, they're not resectable. They're generally invasive. Back out, put chest tubes in, and get the oncologist to start treating with radiation. <clears throat> okay? But that's the chylothorax. So what you're going to need to remember for the writtens is the analysis, which is cholesterol, triglycerides, and LDH. And for the orals, you're going to need to remember, don't let them push you. Conservative, conservative management is still the mainstay. So how do you diagnose these? Chest x-ray, first and foremost. Lateral decubitus, very important. Okay, you can't tell the difference between atelectasis and pleural effusion just on a plain film. You can go ahead and proceed to CT scan, which is generally what happens in the emergency room. If it's not loculated, you do a thoracentesis with analysis and you can do it blindly. If it is loculated, you want to do a thoracentesis with analysis, but you may need help either with ultrasound or get the inter interventional radiologist to help you. Um, we do them blindly, uh, it works, but if you're not comfortable, that's fine. If it's a transudate medical management of the underlying problem, unless they're symptomatic, and um, if their symptoms aren't relieved, then you think about draining it. And if it's an exudative, if it's loculated, you want to do operative drainage, not a chest tube and a loculated effusion. It does absolutely no good. And if it's not loculated, then you can try a chest tube up front. Okay, and I'm just going to show you some CAT scans. This is a type of effusion that will drain with a chest tube. Okay, put it low, get a right angle tube, make sure it tries to get on the diaphragm. Remember, most people are on their back <coughs> in the hospital, and so these will drain out. These will not drain. Okay, loculate it. And if you start seeing this white, nice, defined line, it has a rind. There's no sense. This has been here for at least three weeks. A chest tube is not going to make any difference. Everybody's panicking because they found something, and they're not quite sure what to do about it. This is the one where you get the ultrasound, you get a sample of fluid, you send it off, it's infected, and you take them to the operating room at your next available time. Okay. <clears throat> And these are some more, loculated OR, loculated OR. This is one loculated, has a tube in, you can see it doesn't drain, OR. Don't blindly stick in chest tubes, particularly for loculated effusions. And that's it. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. The thoracentesis kits that come with like a pigtail drain, do you ever leave those in? I don't use the kits. Trick to doing thoracentesis. Use a triple lumen kit. You can get more. Okay? Just go into the um, mid-scapular line, sixth inner space, use your, your needle, as soon as you get fluid, put the wire in, put the triple lumen catheter in, put a stopcock on it. Re decreases your risk of pneumothorax, decreases your risk of the lung damage, and you get a whole lot more fluid out that way. Okay? And 
you can. I, you know, I have left them in, but they don't do much good. Yeah. As far as limits to how much you drain at one time? None. None. No. 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 You're not going to hurt anybody. Okay. This thing about a thousand cc's and clamp the chest tube or whatever. Uh. -uh. It's not like the bladder. You're not going to get spontaneous hemorrhage. You're not going to. Nothing's going to happen. Not unless you hit the heart. Okay. Anything else? You're all experts. Okay, if I see a chest tube put in a loculated effusion, I'm coming after you. <laughs>